Hello, and welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind the Mitchells versus the Machines. We'd like to thank our friends at Netflix for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, John Cohen. John has produced films, including Despicable Me and the Angry Birds movie, and has worked at Illumination Entertainment, 20th Century Fox Animation, and is currently at Sony Pictures Animation. He's also the chairman of the PGA's Animation and VFX Committee. He's currently working with Sony Pictures on his next feature film projects. Welcome, John. Welcome, panelists. And please, John, take it away. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Um, well, thank you guys for, for watching this panel today with this incredibly talented team. Um, I wanted to introduce the, the producers of the Mitchells versus the Machines, Phil Lord, Chris Miller, Kurt Albrecht. Um, if uh, you guys could maybe tell us a, a quick little bit of uh, background about, about uh, each of you. Kurt, you want to start it off? Sure. Um, well, I've been, I've been working at Sony for, I guess, 10 years or so now, and I've produced shorts there, some specials, and, and been an executive as well. And then when this project came up, I was uh, threw my hat in the ring to be a producer, and I just loved it from the beginning. And Pam Mars and Christine Belson gave me the thumbs up, and, and I joined the team. And, and then these guys show, joined shortly thereafter, but it's been, it's been a great ride. It's been a lot of fun. And, and Chris and I um, have been uh, working together for coming up on 25 years yeah. <laughs> creatively. And uh, one of our big milestones in our career was at Sony Animation making our first film with a lot of the same people that worked on this. Um, that was on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. So when we got a chance to meet uh, Mike Grianda, the, the director and co-writer, we saw a kindred spirit, I think. And uh, it was, it's been a really enjoyable project because his energy reminds us of ours back when we were we lads. Now we're so old and withered. Now we're, yeah, <clears throat> we're still quite young, I'd, I'd probably. Very cool. Well, I love this movie so much. Um, it is so beautifully made, so damn funny. Um, Huge congratulations to you guys on the awesome reviews and the reactions coming from everywhere in the world. I think, was it just 15 days at number one on Netflix's top 10 chart? I believe so. I believe it yeah. just got knocked off uh, today, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Uh, so That's incredible. And, you know, it, to, to, to do that right now during this, this, these pandemic times, is is a huge achievement when you think about the fact that it, it became a a global cultural event, um, and 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 I think that's an experience that 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 not many people have had in life um, because we're we're so used to releasing movies and in TV shows in traditional ways. But what was that experience like releasing the movie on Netflix? Um. I mean, obviously we would originally, when we were working on it, had uh, intended for it to be seen in theaters. Um, it was supposed to come out of September of last year, but that seemed uh, very clearly not, was not going to happen. Uh, and then there was a lot of discussions about, you know, this movie has a lot of universal and timeless themes, but there's also a lot about it that feels very contemporary and of the moment. And I think, uh, and I think as, as witnessed how it's really resonated with people, it really speaks to the moment that we're going through right now. And so, um, you know, in conversations with the studio was sort of like, well, we can let this sit on the shelf for uh, who knows how long, uh, or we could, you know, get it in front of uh, millions of people right away so they could enjoy it and find some joy in, in while they're going through this thing. And so, Netflix was really excited about the movie and they were really passionate about it. And we felt like, well, I mean, they, they seem to get it and I think they're gonna support it a lot. And so, you know, obviously we love seeing things on the big screen and having groups of people uh, watch it together as a, as a communal situation, but it's just not the world we're living in right now. And so this seemed like uh, 
the best way to safely let a lot of people see it. And, uh, and you're totally right. The fact that it was on Netflix allowed it to be something that so many people were uh, able to see uh, in a way that, you know, would be like the number one movie of all time if it was in theaters. <laughs> Uh, um, so so many uh, humans got to see it and got to see it multiple times and it and it really meant a lot to people so I think it was a really great experience I think it's also you know it's a it's a movie about a family that is you know stuck in a uh, in a tin can for most of the movie together forcing them to reckon with whatever differences they might have and that's the situation we all find ourselves in is you know most of us are um, spending uh, more time with our families than we've ever imagined and and I think it really connected with people who are looking for something to watch together um, that they can what everybody can enjoy on their own terms and and I think the timing wound up working in the movie's favor. Yeah I, th I think what's interesting, interesting too is is everyone got it in their home on the same moment. You know, all of my kids, friends and family and it, the, the, the turnout, even though it really wasn't turnout because everyone was in on that first day was just amazing to see the reaction happen immediately like that. Whereas if it had been in theaters, it would have taken weeks for people to see it. You know, it was everyone on the same, the same weekend. It was amazing. That's great. That's awesome. And, you know, it, it, it's such an emotional movie. The emotion lands so, so beautifully. And, and I think that comes from the family dynamic. You know, the, the relationship between Katie and, and Rick is so great. And, and what, what worked so well for me is that I, I was able to relate to both of their perspectives, you know, both of their points of view. You know, I, I, I remember being in, in Katie's shoes um, and now with kids of my own, I, I see it completely from Rick's side as well. Um, would, would love to hear you guys talk about how you, how you landed that, that emotional center. Was it, was it always a part of the film or is it something that, that emerged or evolved along the way? Well, it was always, you know, Mike, Rianda, our, you know, writer, director is both an insanely energetic, funny, wild man and a deeply sincere guy with a huge heart. And so his pitch always had this, um, especially in the first act of the movie, this like, um, you know, deeply emotional problem between a father and a daughter. And I think watching him work the story out over the years it just got kinder to every character mm -hmm. i think the movie maybe started out from katie's point of view and then um opened up to include rick's point of view and and the movie now really loves all of the characters and you feel that you know it takes them on their own terms and understands that everybody's trying to be good even if they're falling short. And I think that really makes the movie come across really warmly. And I think it makes it a much, a much better observation of how families operate. Yeah, I would say a lot of the work that we all did over the last several years on this movie was sort of trying to get, to get those emotional beats uh, to land cleanly and clearly and have you care about everybody and uh, everybody needs to learn something in the movie and everybody needs to go through their own growth. Uh, and I think, you know, to Mike and Jeff's credit, they really uh, never stopped trying to like make each moment be the best it could possibly be and the whole thing be really special. So uh, ended up being uh, something that we were all really proud of. Yeah, and Mike, Mike's the starting point was always Mike and his family, like, you know, the, the characters being based loosely on his family. So every scene started from a real, whether we ended up there or not, started from a very genuine place, you know, so it always came through feeling really truthful for the characters. And that was, a lot, that was great to build on. That's great. It, it is really one of the most honest human emotional family stories of, of 
of anything I've seen in a while. And, and, and a story told against a, a big high concept with, you know, with, with fantastic action and, and, you know, and, and, and animation. Um, you, one other side of the perspective um, is, is the tech side of the movie and, and the villain. And you guys have such an awesome villain in the movie. And, and what I love is that you can also understand things from her perspective. You, you've got a movie that's about connection and, and a family that, that can't communicate or isn't able to, to connect with each other. And then, and then the antagonist of the movie is the technology that is that has taken the place of most of our interpersonal connections. Um, I, I, how did you guys come up with the idea for the villain? Was, was, was there a, a point where you tried different things or was it always going to be, you know, was, was there a chance that it was going to be the, the Mark character or, or, or was, was the, the, the phone the, 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 the approach all the time? It was always the phone, but I mean, ultimately it's really Mark's hubris that's the, that's the cause of it. Uh, but it was always the phone, but it went through a lot of different uh, versions as far as like what what Pal's motivation would be and how it would connect to the story we were seeing with the Mitchell family. And, you know, there's a lot of generic sort of like AI is determined humans are not no longer necessary. So we're going to get rid of them. But what was, we were trying to find an emotional hook as to like why Pal would want to uh, get rid of humans. And, uh, and when we finally came upon the idea that she was feeling abandoned by Mark, her creator, uh, in the same way that Rick was feeling abandoned by Katie, that felt like, oh, this has a thematic link. Uh, and also it's an emotional way into a story that you've seen a million times before. You've never seen an AI story where the AI wants to take over the world because the AI's feelings were hurt, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, um, and so, it felt some, like something we hadn't seen before. And we were like, oh, this is the, and, that, and once that change was made, those scenes suddenly came alive and became some of the funniest uh, and uh, most interesting scenes of the whole movie, I think. It helped with the Mark character too, because then it gave him and Rick some similarities mm -hmm. as well, you know. You know, finding ways to connect those two stories was the, the big one of the big challenges after one of our test screenings. And it it just uh, it, the work paid off. It was a lot of little moves, <laughs> you know, to sort of draw the parallels and so that the, the stories, you know, affected one another. And because uh, that family, no matter what you did, was uh, was everybody's favorite thing about the picture. So it was just about trying to get everything else to that same level. It also helps when you cast Olivia Coleman, who is an international <laughs> treasure and a super genius and can make every line funny and interesting. So that's also- And like lovable, you know, like it's like you're, it's like it's, you're on that character's side when she's frustrated, you know? Totally, you, you, you humanize the phone and, and you feel <laughs> badly for this phone. Like I, 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 I was like so genuinely invested in it from that perspective, which, um, you know, I mean, if you think about the connections we all have with our, our technology, with our phones specifically, no one's phone has the same exact apps. They all look differently. We have, a, we have this thing with us most of the day. And so it's, it's, it, it was really, really clever how you guys were able to bring out a character. Well, I mean, like my phone, other than my wife, is like the last thing I see before I go to bed and the first thing I say hello to when I wake up in the morning. And, you know, and when my kids go to someone's house that has an Alexa, they're just constantly trying to get Alexa to tell a joke or sing a song. And I'm like, leave Alexa alone. She's, she's done enough. It's like, give her a break. Uh, but, and uh, you can't help but want to humanize these things. I also think you've, you know, they say that like we co-evolved with dogs to become where we domesticated them and they domesticated us. And we have this now relationship with these animals going back, you know, millennia. And I'd say that we've started a relationship with technology that we sort of can't deny. And now we have to make it a good relationship that's healthy 
<laughs> but I don't know that the, you know, but the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, you, you know, it's funny, you, you talk about the Alexas, we just got an Alexa, you know, mid pandemic and, and then got a second one for a different room. Are they friends? Like, are, or are they competitive with one another? I, I, they must hate each other. But it was so funny because I, I heard my four-year-old daughter the other day say, you know, Alexa, I love you. And I love other Alexa, like just making sure she was like. <laughs> <laughs> so her feelings didn't get her. In case she's also listening. Right. Yeah. She probably is. And the NSA also, I love you, NSA. I love you, NSA. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. No, I love you, Algo. Yeah, short for algorithm. Um, you know, and by the way, technology, especially with the way animated movies are are made, where they take a long time to to produce, we're in a world where our, our technology is changing sometimes, like every couple months, in in pretty significant ways. Um, you know, the media changes, you know, today we're in a world where, you know, NBC could be buying CBS or whatever's going on. But um, when you guys were making the movie, was it, was it something you had to constantly think about? Was it hard for you to stay ahead of the technological developments? Or were there things that you guys created for the film that ended up becoming realities over the course of making the movie? How did that work? Well, we, we tried quite deliberately to be a little bit behind <laughs> because it felt like when we were very of the moment that it felt like it was pandering or that it wasn't going to age very well. So I think Mike was quite deliberate at um, at kind of representing the, the YouTube era <laughs> of the internet pretty well. Um, and also making sure that the content that was on screen was really specific to Katie and weren't just references, but were really about like the kinds of things she wanted to make and see. And every so often we would, you know, we would have content in there. There's a scene late in the movie where Rick is trying to use the internet and there's all these videos besieging him and some of them are real and some of them are things we couldn't clear. And uh, some of them are made by friends of ours. Uh, and we just called them up and said, can we use your thing? They said, great. But when we couldn't clear it, we would just make up a new one that seemed like it belonged, which is why the words deregulate tapioca have become a <laughs> hashtag. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, and one thing that's, you know, the, they, Mike and uh, the uh, production designer, Lindsay Olivares, who is, super talented and she was really responsible for like the look of the character design and the feel of the of the, the animation were interested in was making sure that the uh, graphical interface of all of the PAL stuff felt accurate and so they hired a real like tech uh, graphic design guy to manufacture all of like the PAL stuff so it really felt like a real app and a real Silicon Valley company and that that accuracy was great because the reality of the universe of those robots with their sort of anti-gravity like laser cannons and other technology that makes no sense that you have to kind of shrug and go along with because the rest of the movie is so grounded and real and the family and their story is real and the, the place of the starting from is so real that it allows you to go to some really ridiculous places with that storyline. That's great. It, yeah, it's, you know, visually, in terms of the design of it all, the, the, the movie has such a fantastic style to it, which is unique and gorgeous, um, you know, unlike any other animated movie. And, and I loved the, the way you found that juxtaposition of, of the high tech and, and the feeling of very handmade art. Um, did you guys approach the movie with that in mind? Was there a desire to find, I guess, first a, a unique look of picture and, and how did that evolve? And, and when, you, when you did, was it something that you were, you know, kind of basically setting out to, to, to create that juxtaposition? Well, 
Um, you know, Mike always ha he has a very cartoony, hand-drawn sensibility that he likes, and bringing on Lindsay uh, as the character designer and production designer, she has a very uh, you know hand-drawn, watercolor paint style aesthetic. And when we came on board, we were like, this doesn't have to be just the conceptual art. This we had learned from breaking the system at Sony and at Imageworks on Into the Spider-Verse that whatever you can imagine, they can make. You know, it, you have to, we are, the pipeline had already been broken. So we're like, well, it's already broken and we learned a lot. So let's break <laughs> it again and break it in new ways. Uh, and so then Mike was sort of like, really? You think they'll let us do it? And we're like, not only will they let you do it, everybody who worked on Spider-Verse doesn't want to go back to doing things normally. And anybody who didn't work on Spider-Verse wants to do something like that because they want to have their opportunity to do so. And so we had a lot of the Spider-Verse team, Michael Lasker running the VFX, who had uh, was responsible for a lot of the new technologies. and was excited to sort of take this look that Mike and Lindsay had developed, which was sort of a very hand-drawn, very watercolor, uh, very analog style uh, and try and translate that into a CG movie. And that's why the movie has its very uh, unique texturing uh, and line work and, um, and stylization. And, and it was not easy to get there, uh, but everyone was really excited to do it because they wanted, everyone wanted to do something that you've never seen before. You wanted, um, you know, the, the marketplace to be crude sort of demands that these movies distinguish themselves with there's so much good work happening in our animation community that that you know it was really important for this picture to have to you know to plant a flag somewhere and really stake out its own look and feel and it was you know our job was mostly to hold Mike to his word that he wanted this movie to look really different and feel like it was made by human hands, especially since part, half of the movie takes place in really synthetic environments. That was part of his vision. We said, you, you have to stick to your guns. Your job is not to make this movie convenient for image works, <laughs> right? You know, your job is to inspire people to do things that haven't been done yet which was sort of a way of foisting this problem onto Kurt's so sh shoulders <laughs> because he had to actually make it happen and making it inconvenient means making it inconvenient for production. But you guys managed somehow, Kurt. We did. In inconvenient, sure, but challenging is a better word. You know, it was, it was, it, it was, a, it was a great team, you know, and, and the Lindsay's look, was so specific that it gave us a great target, especially for the human world. You know, like the, we spent a ton of time on Rick's jacket. If you guys remember all those, all the look that we did on how his jacket would react and have this painterly quality as light hit it and moved him through space. That was lots and lots of time was spent, was spent getting that right. We spent a lot of time on the trees, getting them to look like they were hand painted. And once we landed a few things, like I remember the trees and the jacket were key. Once we landed a few of those things, and had that campsite was one of the first sets that looked great. Then it then it kind of rippled through the rest of the movie, you know. And you kind of figured out the technology, and we used the line tool from Spider Verse, and it evolved. And that's one of the things that's great about ImageWorks is it's it's never st static. You know, the the tools are ever evolving. Every movie presents a new challenge, and it gets just gets better and and more automated, and which gives you the chance to do more with them. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. And then, John, you were talking about the contrast between like the human world and the robot world. And that was always the intent to have them be as divergent as we could, we could get it, you know? So there's a, they are very different. And we, we had that early on um, in the, you know, the robot world in a way is easier because it's flatter planes and, and it's simpler, but we still wanted some of that hand-drawn, lighting effect to be in there just so just so it didn't look so sometimes the early tests where they were so different it looked like two movies like they didn't didn't belong together so it was finding that balance of giving it you know so it all it all believed it was a a consistent world you know, we've mentioned Lindsay a couple of times that's Lindsay Oliveris who's our um, production designer and character designer who was this is her 
first feature really in that role. And one of the things that Kurt and his team did really well is support young filmmakers like Lindsay, our head of story, you know, Guillermo and, and a lot of people that were doing it for the first time. And uh, you have to be, one of the reasons Kurt is such a great guy to work with on this is he knows how important it is, how valuable that energy is. That, that idea that you know people that want to do something that feels and looks different and that is reflects their own personal style and point of view is gold in our world you know so the, and so the job of production is to maximize that um, that specific take that they're bringing and it's not simple yeah, if you've got someone who knows what they want it, the that's that's gold because then you're just executing on what that what that vision is it's the it's when there's less decision that's harder because then you spend a lot of time. What about this? What about that? It's, it's, it, that, that is uh, expensive when <laughs> you're not deciding. Cool. Um, well, one other thing, just back to, um, to, to Katie and Rick um, that I wanted to ask you guys about. It's, it's such a universal story, but it's, it's told in such a kind of specific and um, you know, and 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 an and emotional way. Um, you know, I, I was lucky when I grew up that my parents were supportive of of my ridiculous desires and dreams to make movies when I was you know doing stupid puppet shows and using action figures. Um, I, I remember um, I remember there was a family friend who made some snarky comments about the stuff that I wanted to do. Um, and, and it's stuck in my mind, you know, clearly till today because I'm talking about it. Um, but you get some motivational value from it. But for, for you guys, was there, was there anyone in your life that you had that sort of Rick and Katie dynamic with where, you know, is, you, you, you felt a need to kind of prove or they were, they were challenging what you wanted to do and did that help you? We'd love to hear any, any stories that, that you have from your past. Well, it's funny because, you know, this is sort of father-child uh, relationship stories uh, seem to be a recurring theme in a lot of the movies that Phil and I have done from the Lego movie and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and many others <laughs> and, and Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Uh, so people always wonder like, what, they've got something going on with their dads. But the truth is that our dads are actually really supportive of us. But I think, you know, my dad was like, didn't understand the stuff that I was doing and all the weird, same thing, puppets and short films and, you know, comic strips and all the weird stuff that I was doing and didn't understand it at all. But he was supportive uh, uh, and like, was like, I don't get it, but I, but good, but I, I'm, I'm with you and good luck, good luck out to there. you, son. <laughs> yeah, but sort of like you go, go chase your dream, and and if you, if it works for you, then that works for me, and if it's making you happy, that's great. We've so, never but like the lumber mill that. will always be here for you <laughs> if you need it. Exactly, he does actually uh, is an actual miller. Uh, <laughs> um, so there is a famous uh, uh, conversation between our two fathers. That's right. Chris and I went to college together and we had a little kind of a premiere party for our two senior mm -hmm. films that are hand drawn by us. And we they're like 10 minutes long and we spent, I don't know, a year making them. And um, our parents flew up and we had a little cocktail party after the screening and my dad and and Chris's dad are like, uh, you think they're gonna, is this, are they gonna be okay? <laughs> My dad is like, uh, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I remember telling my mother, mom, I, I just saw 2001 and I think I know what I wanna do with my life. And she goes, oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> because my parents were both um, musicians. My dad had, had uh, uh, had a dance company all on, on top of that for a decade. And I think they both knew how difficult a career in the arts is. And they all they wanted was for me to do something that was reliable. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's worked out, but there was a lot of anxiety. 
for, for, for me, my parents were both school teachers and they were always, they don't, I still to this day, I don't think they understand what I do, but, but it's, they're always been supportive and taught me a, a work ethic. Like no matter what you do, whatever it's going to be, do it hard, you know, <laughs> do it well, push and do things as good as you can. And I, that's what, that's what, that's what I think Kristen felt like about me. Like you just keep going, like you just got to keep making it better. And I, and I think that's a great lesson to learn no matter what you do, honestly. But that's what's, that's what's uh, gotten me where I am is just don't give up, keep going. That's I, I, I was lucky enough to, for my dad at one point after Chris and I had moved here and been out here a few years and it wasn't always great, you know, and he's, my dad told me on the phone once, his son, you're an artist and I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and I, I and I've often repeated that to other people. I thought it was really, it was really helpful for me to hear that it acknowledged how hard it was going to be and that there was, um, and that there was no escape. <laughs> That's awesome. H have you guys ever gone back and, and looked at any of the stuff that you, you created when when you were you were little and and you know stuff you wrote stuff you you drew just to see how it holds up I, I I've done like little little dives into into old movies and and you know they're 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 pretty terrible and yet I'll still see something that I find funny you know or something that still for me holds up but I'm curious to see if you guys have revisited any of your your old old stuff Right. Well, you know your audience, right? You're like making something for an audience of one person. Um, I have been too terrified to watch my student films, that's for sure. Um, because I, I, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, but, you know, I have come upon old short stories or ideas for movies or things that I come across like, hey, you know what, there's something, there's something in there that, you know, it's not to, it's like of a period uh, that uh, is no longer uh, the way we tell stories now, but there's something interesting there. So it's, it's if you can get past the cringe, uh, you know, you can usually find a nugget of something. Um, there was one thing that we made that I still, I showed to somebody recently, which was the Bronte sisters power dolls thing that we made, which was in 98, like the first live action thing we ever shot, which was a fake educational, fake commercials for uh, toys based on historical figures. Uh, and it was like uh, the Bronte sisters, like action figures commercial. <laughs> and uh, and it actually weirdly holds up, I have to say, even after all these years, it's 90 seconds though. So it's a lot easier. Cool. Kurt, anything you did as a, as a kid? No, nothing for me. I actually didn't make films as a little kid, but I would write little things. My mom saves everything. So every now and then one of those will come to me in the mail, a little, you know, creative writing project or something like that. And there, there's like always like, like, you know, a little bit of an idea in there, but the, <laughs> the prose is not, not what you'd hope for. <laughs> Well, the, um, just to jump to another topic, the the music of the movie is is just awesome, and um, one part of the, the the animation filmmaking process that I find people are often surprised to hear about is, you know, is how different it is to score a movie in animation than than in live action, um, because the the composers are able to to be involved in in the creation of themes and, and even start to score with some synth um, as you're landing the animatic. Um, and, and you guys have worked with, with Mark Mothersbaugh now a, a ton Many of times. times. His score is so beautiful in this movie. The melodies are just wonderful. Um, and I, I wonder if you, if you could just talk about the, the process of working with him how it works in, in, in your animated films and projects. Um, and if there's anything just from your collaboration and process, just, you know, the shorthand uh, that, that, that has become helpful working with him. Well, Mark, you know, Mark is famous for, and this is true, he's one of the most creative people you could ever meet. It just oozes out of him. No, no one represents, you're an artist and there's nothing you can do about it better than Mark. 
But one of the surprises that maybe not everybody realizes is he probably is one of the most melodic writers in in movies. And he writes the most beautiful melodies of anybody. So that was one of the things we discovered with him on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. You know, when you start working with Mark, he sends you a bunch of kooky sounds and improvisations, like a 50 track CD of like, here's a bunch of weird stuff. Let me know what you gravitate towards. And then you'll go to his beautiful office on sunset at Mutado and he'll sit down and be like, I wrote a song that I think is the, is sort of represents the movie and it'll have this beautiful melody in it. And you'll go like, that's, that's now we just have to make a score out of this song. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, coming from a, you know, being in a band it's, and writing songs for a living, it makes sense. He wrote a bunch of really famous, catchy songs that have really stood the test of time. So you, you really have the whole package with Mark and he's a very, you know, funny, strange guy who has a humongous heart. And I think that's why we thought that he would pair really beautifully with Rianda. And he did. And I mean, and I think that score is, you know, one of, one of his best um, because it really takes advantage of his superpowers, which is like very sweet and emotional melodies. And then also weird synthy Moog, like crazy, uh, beepy boopy <laughs> music also and that the whole movie is this like dialectic between these two uh things and and that's where mark really shines and so he was able to use all of his superpowers on this movie yeah he, he's famous for that you know for making music out of his devo songs you know and then he just seems his whole career to have been obsessed with synthetic things mm -hmm. and, and the, the dialectic between that and human beings. And you, and so it's just a, the perfect fit. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kurt, sorry. No, I was just gonna say one thing that worked to our advantage was that we finished this movie in 2020 working from home. So when we were supposed to score, we couldn't get an orchestra together because it was the very beginning of the shutdown around the world. So we couldn't get players in a room together. So that pushed out the scores and the, and the production pushed out a little bit because of just finishing it from home. So he ended up recording the score to almost final picture, which almost never happens for him. So he got to see the completed movie and, and work on it more than he would have normally gotten because we were all working from home so remember uh dominic certo his music editor was just was you know flabbergasted that we're gonna have final picture for the for the record that's amazing you know none of us got to go of course but it would have been, it would have been great had we gotten to go <laughs> i mean the other side note is that mark got quite sick from yeah. covid during the sort of end of production wow. and um i could say that because he talked publicly about it and you know, we were really, you know, it was touch and go there for a while. So, you know, we were, um, his crew members and people at Mutato like really um, rallied around him. And mm -hmm. we were just, you know, it's an extra special score because that moment in time made us um, extra thoughtful and appreciative about Mark and his contributions to music and to the movies we've made together. And just what a great human being he is to have in your life. You know, what an inspiring guy. We've spent plenty of times in the basement of Mutado where he's like, come down down here. And he's like, I restored this Raymond Scott harmonium that's three of them in the world. And it's the first synthesizer. And it's just, you want to play it? <laughs> and it's just that sense of playfulness um, and the pleasures that he takes in discovering new things just make him a really inspiring guy to collaborate with. And we're all really grateful to, um, you know, been able to learn from him. Very cool. Um, well, just a couple more questions for you guys. Um, the, 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 the voice casting in the movie is fantastic. Um, is there anything that you, when you're when you're casting actors for animation, look for that is different than than what you would focus on for live action? You know, since of course 
most of the time actors record separately. Is there anything you do to ensure that there's chemistry among them or how do you, how do you tend to, to, to approach it or, or do you approach it differently? Well, I mean, obviously handsomeness is not really that important, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're casting for an animated movie, but, the, but broadly speaking, we're looking for the same things as when we're doing uh, live action projects, which is people who, um, if, especially if it's a comedy, is like people who are comedy generators, who are writers uh, of their own or filmmakers of their own, uh, and people who like will be willing to and excited to play around and try some things and experiment. Um, and so all of these people, you know, Danny McBride, Maya Rudolph, Abby Jacobson, obviously Beck Bennett and Fred Armisen and Olivia Coleman, all of these people are wonderful uh, improvisers and wonderful you know, filmmakers of, uh, in their own right uh, and multi-talents. And so everybody was excited to go like, okay, let's try some things in this scene. Let's see if we can find something. Let's see if we can, uh, you know, let's see if we can take what's on the page as, as an inspiration and then get to some something deeper, more interesting or funnier. And, uh, and because they are writers themselves, things that they'll come up with are, you know, things that we never would have come up with, like, you know, talking about it beforehand. So it's, you get a lot of magic that way. You also get, um, because um, you're trying out voices, you can audition people without them knowing it, <laughs> which is, it works to the benefit of maybe choices that you wouldn't immediately guess because you can hear the voice look at a character that looks nothing like that actor and then go, oh yeah, that really weirdly pops. And so we're pretty thorough about listening to clips, look, looking at it to pictures sometimes. Um, and we've, we're always drawn towards things that feel like they're bringing a new take and that the actors, as Chris is saying, bring something of themselves to it. There's, you know, there's a tendency sometimes for animation voices to sound a little clean and perfect and it's kind of slick. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to avoid that because it, it tends to make it feel um, you, you know, less special, I guess. Yeah, in, in so many ways, it's the imperfections that give it so much more life and personality. You know, the, the feeling of spontaneity is, is really also just where you find like the gold. Um, right, it's like the way, it's like what happens in between words, you know, the way somebody pauses or the, the if you can hear their, thought process or they're almost their lips smacking you know that it's really really valuable as you know stumble or the repeated syllable that sort of thing really like yeah makes it feel real it's 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 the the amazing thing about about improvisation is that you could you could get a delivery of a line that was done perfectly and comedically in a certain way that if you transcribed it looked at it on paper or even had that person try to replicate it just isn't funny, you know. It's 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 all about the spontaneity. Um, one one last question for you guys. Um, this one co comes from a, 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 a producers guild perspective, which is something that I hear from people quite a bit. Um, which is when every year when people are voting for the PGA awards and and, and they get to the animation category. I've heard people ask the question, well, how do you judge good producing in animation? You know, how do you evaluate the producing of, of one animated film versus the producing of another film? And, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what you guys think are good attributes of an animation producer. And, 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 and you know, if, if, if one comes to you, just even, in your opinion, kind of what is one of the, the, the better, best produced animated films of the last few years? Huh. Well, I mean, it's really, it's the same question could be asked of live action really, because there's so many different types of producers. Yeah. Um, I mean, like how do you judge if a film is good and a film is doing something interesting or culturally relevant or new or adding something to the social conversation? 
um, you know, who's to say how much of that is thanks to the good producing work and how much is good to thanks to all of the many, many, many people that make these things. And I think one thing about this film in particular was that it was really a group effort by a lot of people and every aspect of it contributed to it being uh, as good as I think it turned out. And that's, you know, you know, not the least of which are, you know, Mike and Jeff, uh -huh. uh, but also, you know, all of the crew members who were given the power to add uh, their own ideas and um, and not just do what they were told, that, that having an openness to anything that sort of fit in the theme uh, and empowering the entire crew made everybody excited, like, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to go, I'm going to make a puppet pterodactyl out of felt and cups and plastic forks, and they were going to shoot in front of this green screen and clump it into the movie, movie, and everyone's like, yeah, let's do it, which is not a thing that happens in any other movie. Uh, and so I think in terms of the, the producing of it, the fact that this movie was able to uh, push so many boundaries and make something so new and so different with a voice that was so unique uh, and, uh, and turn out in a way that felt like it was, uh, it worked as a movie, I think is the only way that you can judge one of these things is, uh, did the movie work and did it do something new? Right, exactly. Okay, great. <laughs> the producing must have done an okay job. I didn't mess it up. But the proof is in the pudding. I mean, I'm really curious, but Kurt's point of view on this, I know that from where we sit, the, you know, it, I, we, we have a lot of respect for how hard it is to pull any of these movies off, right, John? Like, the, even, even, something that doesn't completely pan out. We all know from our friends on these productions that there were tremendous efforts made to bring the thing in for a landing and the challenges that show up, you know, they're invisible if, if you do your job right. <laughs> and nobody really knows that like, the oh yeah, the whole thing crashed. We had to start the entire movie over eight months before release. And then we threw out the middle act and, we lost an actor, all that stuff goes away by the time it gets released and you don't talk about it out of, you know, just to be polite. So, uh, so all these movies are difficult. Uh, in, in recent years, you know, the things that I've been most impressed by personally are things that break the mold. You know, the, the, we have a, we've worked with this woman, a great producer, Jinko, and she produced that movie Klaus. And that was like at a different studio using a in newly invented process, like going back and forth from the US to Spain and creating an entire new pipeline. That's really challenging and impressive. This year I watched a movie called Our Sound. Um, the Japanese title is Ongaku, which is drawn almost by entirely by one person. <laughs> and that is its own different challenge, you know? So th these are all really what's so wonderful about animation and movies in general is that they, they, they are all, these things are all prototypes. So they're all kind of, I don't know, accomplishments one way or the other. I don't know, Kurt, what do you yeah, think no, I, about? Yeah, I agree with you guys. I mean, I think for me, it's like anything that looks fresh, feels fresh, pushes technology or pushes an art style. Like, you know, I think this movie might not have been what it is without Spider-Verse happening, you know? And that's, that's, not, that's not just you two, it's everyone who worked on that movie and the people that were involved and helped make the technology and who made Sony Pictures more open to doing different things. Oh, they were kid. It's us here. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's the timer bell. Yeah. Like, oh, no, that's if you give a good answer, you get a bell, like a point. <laughs> you get the producer's thing. point. Um, but I, I just, I, I agree. It's the collaborative nature of, of this and everyone who's on the crew bringing their talents to bear and making a unique, a unique picture. And it, and it, and it stands out when it happens, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I don't think people understand or, or know or, or, or can really even comprehend the, the extent to which producers in animation 
live and breathe these movies. They, they become parts of your lives for, for years and years. And you, you are just constantly iterating and, 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 and pushing it forward and making it better. And it's, 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 it's always such an achievement when, when you get out the other end of it. Um, and, and I will say as a compliment to, to, to you guys, one thing that I've heard is that the, the crew and the team working on this movie were so happy and inspired and enthusiastic throughout the making of the movie. Every step of the way, every time someone was working on Mitchell's, they were just pumped about it. And, and, and you heard that in the halls and, and that comes from the top down. And that's, that's a tribute to you guys and, and how you produced it. So that's- uh, Well, that's a nice, really, that's the highest compliment. I, we always say we yeah. wanna be the most miserable people working on the film. <laughs> as, long, as long as everyone else has a good time, it's okay. I will say that, you know, that Mike and his co-director Jeff and Kurt and, and uh, the Imageworks producers too, made the movie a safe place to be creative. And I think that's really important you know, that people feel like they aren't going to get in trouble if they try a new idea or if they raise their hand and say, I think this scene might be better. It might slow down the production a little bit, but I think it's important that we recut this scene or we try one more time. You know, that there, there were times on Spider-Verse where we really faced a production crunch and we stopped and asked ourselves, like, are we like spreadsheet managers or are we filmmakers you know <laughs> this isn't going to be smooth um but we we i know that everyone in this room came here because they wanted to be a filmmaker and we have to solve this as filmmakers not as you know as abacus minders <laughs> right and it's like if we do like if I look at it, if I do my job right and take that pressure off all those people, then you've got artists that are happy, like you're saying, John, and talking about it in the halls, they're going to do better work. They're going to be more excited about working late that night or on the weekend or whatever it is. And, and they're going to deliver you, you know, every, every frame that's on the screen is, is hundreds of people's work. <laughs> you know, if they're happy about it, it's going to look better, you know, so that's it's good for productivity yeah. and it's good. And it's, com and it's, it's good for the, the commercial viability of the project. At the end of the day, that creativity is worth money <laughs> to be gross. <laughs> it, it, it really means something. You can feel it in the marketplace. Yeah, you can feel that nothing about this movie, no shot was half-assed in this shot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, listen, thank you guys so much for, for doing this Q&A. This has been terrific. Um, and Thanks for moderating. You're, uh, you're yeah, a real delight, as always. And, and we are big fans of yours too, John, and admirers of your movies. So it uh, makes it an extra delight. Thank you so much. And, and congratulations on the movie. It's, it's spectacular. Thank you. It means a lot thank coming you. from you. I really appreciate it. Cool. All right. Thank you guys. I guess Bye everybody. Thanks for listening. It. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.